are continuing in this message series entitled Heroes, where we have been looking at New Testament individuals that we find in the Bible that we can look at their lives and glean and learn some things off of them and hopefully apply them to our own lives so that we can grow as believers. And we certainly don't idolize and worship these heroes, because honestly, the Bible's really good, and the Word of God is really great at pointing out their flaws and being clear that God uses imperfect people for His perfect plan. And so I'm thankful that all of the misfits that we find in the Bible, that God, uh, not only will He, has He used them, but God, that means that He will, um, if we will allow Him to, if we will partner with God, that we can uh, be in lockstep with Him and in partnership with Him in the vision that He has for this world, for our lives. And so I'm thankful for, uh, for the examples that we have set before us today. This is part number six. We're looking at the life of Paul. Significant person, individual in the Bible. Paul, for those of you who don't know, uh, he wrote over two-thirds, uh, just, just over two-thirds of the New Testament. And it's not just that he wrote a whole bunch of books. He has completely shaped and changed the entire, not just Christian world, but the entire world. The writings that Paul does, uh, that he shares, the, the revelation about grace and truth and about how all people are saved according to Jesus Christ, including the Gentiles, which would include, I'm assuming, the vast majority of us in here. If you are a follower of Jesus and not Jewish, then you would be considered a Gentile, at least according to the Bible. It's God's grace revealed through Paul's writings that we know that we can be saved. And so there's so many more things, especially when it comes to, the, to understanding that we need to have grace and truth, that we need to have righteousness in our lives. And so the writings of Paul is incredibly important for all Christians and really for the world. But I want to I dive into Paul's earlier life because uh, there's some things there that, if you don't know the story, is pretty eye-opening, and I'd like to share that with you. This is first part is found in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. If you will, I'm setting the stage for what I believe is the one main thing that we can apply to our lives. There's many things in Paul's life and in his writings, but there's one thing that I really felt led this today to bring to us that hopefully will help set us free and encourage each one of us here. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, Paul is... Um, He's writing this now already as a saved person, but he's looking back at his life before he met Jesus, and he's giving an account of his life. He had been challenged at this point um, about how, if you will, how committed he was as a Jew, what his, pre what his pedigree was, how... how was he really someone that was all in it because he walked away from that for the most part, or at least from their perspective, in order to be a Christian? And so really was Paul the guy that he said he was? And so this is what Paul begins to list out his life was. He kind of shows off, if you will, his profile online. This is who I am. Here's the quick highlights. Pay attention, those of you that are challenging whether or not I'm truly a committed uh, um, individual and that I came from um, great purpose when it came to my Jewish heritage. It says in verse 4, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Let me just stop right there. You'll see in almost all of the writings today, Paul has no trouble whatsoever with his confidence level. He's a very, he is very self-assured of himself. He, he is not, has no problem saying what's exactly on his mind. And so, again, he says, if anyone thinks they have confidence, in other words, hey, you want to step up against me? You think you got it? Let me tell you what I have, and, I, and I'm going to shut this conversation down right quick in a hurry. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. This is the list. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal of persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, most of this we read and we kind of glaze over because culturally it means absolutely nothing to us. But to those that he was speaking to, most likely a primarily Jewish audience, those that he was speaking to, this statement, these few uh, sentences here carried a lot of weight. Let me break it down. Beginning in verse 5, it says, circumcised on the eighth day. Well, all Jewish boys were circumcised, but only the most strict religious households would circumcise on the eighth day. And so what he's saying is right off the bat, I came from a very strict religious household. 
The next one he says here is the people of, uh, of the people of Israel. And so you got to understand that Israel is a nation, yes, but Israel is also a people group. And what Paul's saying here is he had a lot of pride, like nationalistic pride in being an Israelite. It, it was something a level of elitism that he had. You know, like sometimes we'll say like, oh, I'm an, I'm an American. And some of you, you, you're thankful for that. Some of you are indifferent. Some of you are not thankful for that. But what he is saying, it would be like this. I'm the American of all Americans. And America is the greatest thing in the whole entire world. Like what he's saying is, is I literally live in the best kind of people. And he's also saying, I'm not like the rest of this world that either is not Jewish or is what they would refer to as dogs and half breeds. They would literally call them that in the streets. If, if you were Jewish and you married somebody that wasn't, you would, uh, your children would be considered dogs and half breeds. Okay. So I'm not condoning what Paul's saying. I'm not saying that he's being nice, because he's certainly not being nice. But that was definitely baked into their culture of what he was saying. And so he was responding according to their, to their culture there. And then it says here that uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, again, not a big deal to us, but the tribe of Benjamin was the most cherished um, tribe of the 12 in Israel. Almost think of it like this, 12 really big families. And, um, and so Benjamin was the one that was the most honored and most, most cherished um, out of all of them. And, or, or at least, I mean, from most people's perspective as it was. So he was not only saying, hey, I came from a religious home. I am a part of Israel. I'm a purebred of a part of Israel. But I'm also a part of the very best family, the best tribe that is in Israel. Next, it says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. What he's saying is, is my parents were Hebrews. I'm Hebrew. I, I adopt the Hebrew um, culture, the language, the ways of doing things. In other words, I'm all in. I'm not partially like, I like some things about America, but not all things. He's like, I'm in on everything from the hot dogs to the watermelons to the fireworks. Like, let's just, I, anything having to do with America, I'm all in. That's basically what he's saying about his tribe, about his nation, and about where he's from. And so you got to understand, just in general, backing up, um, the Greco-Roman world that he's speaking to, that he's living in, the, the, in other words, the greater Roman world, the rule of Rome, um, it was incredibly divided. And it was, it, any kind of division that you can think of, they had. Men versus women, free versus slave, Jew versus Gentile, anybody that's not a Jew. And so absolutely every kind of people group, there was division, there was fighting, there was no common ground. At one side hated the other side, kind of sounds like America, right? Like we all have our things that divide us, and this is, a, our world now is a lot like the world that he was in there. This next part that he says is uh, that as to the law, the rules, if you will, uh, as to the law and the interpretation of the law, I'm a Pharisee. So within, within the Jewish culture, there was really, if you will, two denominations. Like we have church denominations. There was basically two. There were Sadducees and Pharisees. Sadducees were more open in their interpretation of the law. They were, uh, in, our, in our vernacular, we'd probably say a more, on a, more of a liberal vent, bent and, and how they perceived and pursued the law. And they also very much denied and walked away from anything supernatural. They wanted nothing to do with su anything supernatural. On the other side, complete opposite aisle, you had uh, the uh, Pharisees, and they were incredibly strict in how they interpreted and lived out the law. And in that, uh, they were very open to supernatural spiritual things. And so, you know, both sides thought they were right. Both sides had scriptures to back them up. You know, they were fully convinced that the other side was the enemy and they were the great ones. And so what he's saying is, is I, I don't even want to be vague in what I'm saying. I want to be very clear. I am a Pharisee, so there's no confusion. I am not on team Sadducee. I'm on team Pharisee. And so he says that right there. Next it says, as to zeal, how passionate are you? How, how much are you in favor in pursuing the things of God? As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. The way that he exemplified his passion for God was to persecute the church. The church, by the way, is you and I. 
those, if you're here, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we are a part of what's called the church. Not, I mean, we're in a physical church, this is a local church gathering, but we're a part of what's called the church, the universal church, and that's what Paul hated and went against. He said, so if you want to know how passionate I was, I persecuted the church. Well, the language there, zeal and, and persecution put together, the original language lends to this idea that Paul, in almost purity of heart, that he was seeking to cleanse the world of this spiritual disease called Christianity. It was this new movement that was taking place, this new church, if you will, that popped up that said, hey, everything that you believed up to this point, the answer is over here. Come over here and hang out with us. And so Jewish leaders hated the message of Christianity, even though we know and we believe that Jesus did not come to do away with all of the teaching of Judaism. He didn't come to do away with it and to you know, say that all of it's wrong. He came to fulfill it. And to complete it. And so there's no, from a Christian standpoint, there's no competition there. But in this day and age, there absolutely was. It was the new kid on the block, and the new kid on the block was, was full of heresy. And Paul saw that as a spiritual abomination that had to be eradicated. And so when he persecuted the church, it, he should not have done that. And, and, and you never should murder people or go after anybody like that. But in his mind, and I'm not justifying him, I'm just, we got to get to, we just got to hear where he's from. In his mind, he was protecting the pure message that he received in the Torah and, and throughout other writings. And so he was trying to keep heresy outside um, and, and not have that infiltrate because almost all of the new believers, in fact, I believe all of the, the first Christians, they were Jews. And so these are people that were followers of one, and then they shifted over to Christianity. And so this was their brothers and their sisters falling away from the faith and following something completely different, something that they saw as false doctrine that would lead you to hell. And so it says, as to zeal, I perse a persecutor of the church. He sought, if you will, to ethnically cleanse the world of the virus that is the church. He sought to do that, and by the way, every single religion has sought to do that. Non-religious people have sought to do that. People hate the church because the enemy hates the church because it's the love of God marching forward. And so Paul was trying to stamp it out. He was trying to snuff it out. The last part it says here, as to righteousness, how, how well did he do? Did he live a good life or did he sin a lot? Did he mess up? As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Whoa, that seems like a pretty big statement to make to say that you did not mess up or violate a single law. You got to understand, they had over 600 laws they had to keep. We struggle with knowing and following 10 laws, the 10 commandments. They had 600 that they had to keep. And he's saying, I was blameless. Most scholars do not believe that he was lying. Most scholars believe that what he's saying is in comparison to you, I kept the laws blamelessly. I did it the right way. Not perfect, but I, my heart was in it to win it, and I stayed the course. I fought that good fight. And so again, Paul is just laying all this stuff out in these scriptures. Some things that aren't listed in the scriptures, just things we know about Paul, is um, his family were incredibly wealthy uh, tent makers, and uh, they had political and religious influence all day long. In fact, when Paul went to Rome, he actually purchased his citizenship for somewhere around $200,000 to $220,000 just to purchase a Roman citizenship so you could be a part of the club, basically. He, they would do that. Uh, there's scriptures that talk about him being in jail where um, the guards would want to keep him longer to get more money out of him. And so everywhere that he went, he had money, he had influence, and people listened to him because of his family. He studied at the University of Tarsus, which would be the equivalent of saying like he studied at, at uh, Harvard or Yale, and he spoke multiple languages. So this is just kind of like the rap sheet of, of Saul, if you will. And by the way, you're going to hear me use the words Saul and Paul interchangeably. It's because actually they're both his names. He was always called Saul. Later on, he was called Paul. A lot of scholars believe he was actually called both at the same time. And so Saul and Paul is the exact same person. I'm not talking about two different heroes today. So with that... Uh, I want to keep talking more about Paul. 
I think there's more that we had to learn from him. But first, I want to share this with you. I remember growing up, and um, I remember the first time I was in elementary, I think it was like second or third grade, and we did like a little race outside. It was an all-day recess day, and we were outside, and we did a race. And I, I beat him. I was the fastest kid at the school. I was the fastest kid all the way up, um, almost all the way through high school. And, um, well, it didn't do me any good. I'm, I can't run to save my life. But... Um, I loved running just because I loved beating people. <laughs> but I remember getting a first place ribbon. You guys remember getting these little ribbons? I mean, regardless if it's school or like, you know, Boy Scouts or whatever it is, like we got these ribbons for things that we would do. And this one right here says first place. This is the one that everybody wants. This is the one that if you, even if you raised a hog and the hog is pretty, you get first place, you're happy. Four, four over, not four over, four was a pretty good Four H, there it is. Um, so like we have these competitions and we get these little cheap ribbons and they mean the world to us, especially especially when we're younger. I remember getting these, and I would show it to my parents, my friends. we go to grandma's house for Christmas. You see that right there? I ran faster than everybody else, right? <laughs> this is important to me. This was real. This was something that I, I loved. And so we would get, you know, everyone wanted first place prize, but you didn't always get it. Sometimes you got second. Now, depending on how you were raised, uh, second is really good. Some of you, second just means you're a first place loser. So it just depends on how you were raised. I'm not condoning one side or the other. You're just the first loser in the bunch. So there's second. Third place ribbon, let's be honest, means absolutely nothing at this point. You're third place. It means nothing. So those are the ones that you were like aimed for. First, maybe second, and you'd always have to explain it. I got second. It's because, you know, I, I ate too much food right before the race. Like you'd always have to explain why you got second place and why for some reason you couldn't get first. But then I remember... Um, towards, I don't know, the end of school my, uh, for me, that this, another award started showing up. Now, I don't have a ribbon for that particular one. I have one right here that says best overall. Best overall. You know what that's code for? You don't know how to do it, but you've got a really nice personality. That's what that's code for, okay? So they had this one, but I remember one that really showed up, and again, I don't have a ribbon for it, but it was um, the most improved which means when you started this, you were terrible. And now you've gotten better. You're certainly not first place, but you've gotten better. I think that's a good award. I think having that, I think having that affirmation is a good thing. I'm not sure, sir, about best overall. Again, that's just a personality award, but it's there. Certainly none of us want this one right here. I don't even think they give this one out, but last place. None of us want that. No, that's, this is the one of the worst ones that you want to have right here. So we would all avoid a last place award right there. But here's where the trouble comes in. This is where I start to have issues with these little ribbons, these little token nods to your success. Basically, when I was done with school, there was a new ribbon that came out. There's a new one that came out. And some of you parents, you're perpetuators of this. You're the drivers of this. I forgive you. <laughs> Is this one right here? Participant award. You just showed up. You got the snacks at the end of soccer, basically, is what you did. <laughs> Participant rewards, in my personal opinion, are worth absolutely nothing. Now, there's some of you right now that are immediately offended. Our children need to be affirmed, and they need to know that they're amazing. Then just tell them that. But don't make a fake award. It's green. This means nothing participant reward? You guys all showed up and get a participant award at this point. Like showing up means nothing to me. But some people, man, my kids showed up and they got participant award. You know? I don't know. I'll, I'll, I guess I probably should hold my opinion to myself on that one. But anyway, there's these awards, there's these ribbons. I'm going to come back to them, okay? All I just remember is when I would get the big one, the big blue, when I would get it, oh man, it was amazing, world changing for a little boy to know that he was the best at whatever he did. I'm going to read on now, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and 3. This is really a game-changing moment for Paul, still referred to as Saul. Uh, this is the make the man kind of moment for him. Stephen, who we now know many, many years later, Stephen was the very first martyr in the Christian church. He was the first person to die for the sake of the message of Jesus Christ and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so Stephen would not stop preaching. He would not stop bringing the good word. And so he was dragged before the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, and 
they were threatening to stone him if he wouldn't stop. He would not stop. And so they drag him outside. They bring him and throw him at the feet of Saul. Saul at this point is a young man. He has all the privilege and all the pedigree as like wind in his sail. And now he's at the point where he's a young man and they bring him to Saul and Saul makes the decision, a determination to kill Stephen. And they go forward with that. So literally the very first martyr in the Christian church, the decision for that man's life was in Saul's hands. Let's go ahead and read that account right here. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and 3. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution again uh, against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So first thing you have to know out of that, the council and Saul did not have the legal right to do what they did. They were operating as rogue agents outside of the law. They could not condemn anybody to death. That was not what they were allowed at that time to do, and yet they went through with it. They had so much hatred towards Christians that they were ready to kill them. And they did. They started with Stephen and it continued and still continues to this day. The word here that Saul was ravaging the church. Saul was ravaging the church. That's how it's, that's how it's translated in this version, the ESV, the English uh, Standard Version. But maybe a better way or a more accurate way to the original language, Greek, would be this. Saul was a rabid, wild hog. And so when we say ravaging the church, a better understanding is not just a wild hog, which is strong, which is already pretty vicious. They got the, you know, the, not hooves, what are these things? Uh, horn spikes, teeth spikes, those things, right? They got those things. But they're saying it's a rabid, wild hog. And so in other words, if you're there, and you're living in your life, and you have your land, and you have your home, a wild hog, especially a rabid one, one that's out of its mind, one that's diseased, one that's just like, bah! one that would do that would come in and would just eat all of your fields, would just plow and trample through your fields. It would break into your house, just break the door down, and it literally would grab children and other people in the house, would drag them out or just maul them right there. So the, the imagery, the picture that's being said here is Paul was not going from house to house going, excuse me, I'm just doing a 2020 census. I got a question for you. Are you a Christian? You are? Okay, come to prison with me. I'll just this way right here. No, he was like a rabid, wild hog going from house to house, hunting down Christians. That's what it says about him. Notice that it said there that he would drag off men and women. So there was a difference, especially in this day and age. There was a difference in men and women and how they were treated. Women did not have near as many rights as they do now. They were absolutely considered second-class citizens as far as influence and all that kind of stuff, which we know is terrible. But at the same time, they were also treated better when it came to matters of war and violence and stuff like that. So if you were, if you were someone that was going to go in and pillage a land or whatever, by and large, at least in this culture, women and children were off radar. You could not touch them. You could not. That, that's, even for evil intentions, that's not good. It didn't stop Paul. Paul personally, notice he didn't say he sent men from house to house. It says Paul went there from house to house, dragging off men and women. And whether he dragged off the children or he just left the children there to be orphans, it doesn't matter. Either way, destroying homes, destroying lives, he dragged them off to prison. He didn't bring them, by the way, to the type of jails and prisons that we have now. And I know the American justice system and jails are still pretty messed up and there's some things that definitely need to be changed. But I also know that at times there's recess outside. And I know at times there's some cable TV and there's three meals and there's some protections and rights afforded to them. That's not what a Roman jail was like. When you went to prison, 
You were there basically for life. You're not getting out. You were in the most deplorable, disgusting circumstances of your life. There was many times no light. You were surrounded by mice and rats and tons of infestations. You had just barely enough food and water, stale and maggot-filled at best to survive. This was a terrible place to basically die. You went there and there wasn't visitation. You went there and there wasn't Radiant Church live streaming into it. And and like, it wasn't that at all. This was the worst place you possibly could be. One of the worst places. I'll tell you this way. The Romans, they knew how to torture people. They were really good at it. That was kind of like one of their gold stars. They knew how to, that was their blue ribbon. We are good at torturing people. And so Paul would kick down doors like a ravage, like a, like a, like a crazy, rabid, wild dog and hog, excuse me, and he would kick down doors and take men, women, possibly children, and bring them to prison, many of which he would kill. That's how this is described. That's how Paul describes himself. This isn't some random news reporter that hates Paul. This is Paul, how he describes his situation. In fact, actually written right here was written by Luke, but it's confirmed later by Paul that it was all true. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, while I won't read it, this is additionally how Paul describes himself. He says, I was a blasphemer. A blasphemer is not just saying the Lord's name in vain. A blasphemer means to deliberately speak foul, vile, hate-filled things that if you, in today's culture, that intentionally trigger people. Like your goal is to hurt people to the nth degree with your words, have vile things coming out of your mouth. Again, not a political argument, not your perspective, but some of the most hate-filled things you possibly could imagine. Words that, um, you, that anybody would just cover their ears on going, that is unacceptable. I cannot believe that you would say that. Remember, he's doing that in the name of God right? He said, I was a blasphemer. He also said that I was a persecutor. The word persecutor, original word in Greek, is likened unto a high level skilled hunter, one that would track an animal down and it would track its prey down. And so Paul was, again, not just figuring this out as he went. He wasn't marginally successful. Paul was amazing at what he did. He hunted human beings down to imprison them or to kill them. That's what he did. And the third thing he says about himself, a word we don't use too much nowadays, is injurious, which means this. Not only did he do everything, but he actually derived great pleasure from doing it. As he tortured people, imprisoned them, split families up, said foul foul things to them, as he did all of these things, it was then that he was happy. He found joy happiness out of torturing human beings. That's who Paul is, by the way. I know we don't like our politicians for the most part, and I know we all would want someone bigger, different, better, in all the different positions, but I'm telling you, we have no one like Paul that we've ever experienced, at least in America. Like, this guy was bad on every sense of the word, and that's me putting it very nice. And so this is someone who with much pride, tried to destroy the church. So I hope you guys are kind of getting the picture that Paul, uh, if there was ever a lost cause when it comes to the love and forgiveness of God, it would be Paul. I mean, we all have our history. We all have things that we've messed up. But Paul, come on, man. I mean, wow, you were like slaughtering people. That's, that's bad. Until this happens, Acts chapter 9. I won't read the whole thing. But this is Saul's conversion. Saul requests papers to go into the synagogues in Damascus, a town far, far away, to go there and to do the same thing, to find Christians, hunt them down, imprison them, or kill them. And in addition to that, he would also be in the practice of hiding people within the Christian celebration. So it'd be like, duck, 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 goose. That person right there is a spy, and he's there just to make sure that we know where the Christian worship's happening. So when Paul comes to town or other people, we can go, hey, right over here, they meet every Thursday night at 2 or 2 p.m. or 7 p.m., right over here. And so people are terrified of Paul. They know who he is. They know what he does. That's what Paul's doing. He's bringing his crusade 
into another town called Damascus. He's riding along on his horse, him and a whole bunch of people. And the word tells us that not only he, but his entire team was actually knocked off of their horses because a bright light, brighter than the sun, appeared in the sky and it engulfed Jesus. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't say, why are you killing my people? Why do you not like the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? Because when, and this is a side note, but the way that you minister to people, especially Christians, is how you're actually ministering to Jesus Christ. And so he said, why are you persecuting me? And then Paul begins to have a conversation with him. Eventually in that conversation, while he's blind, he's on his back in the dirt, he says, Lord, Lord. So his heart connects to who Jesus is. He's now blind, and so he has to be led by the hand back to, or back to the village where he sits there for three days waiting for someone to come and to lay hands on him so that he can receive his sight. While he was there, not only was he blind, but he did not eat, he did not drink. It's not because he was fasting. It's because he just saw the brightest fireworks show in the world, basically, from heaven. Jesus Christ saying, stop killing me and my people. And he is in deep shock of the fact that he has literally been going against God himself, the creator of the universe. And so he's waiting. At the same time, God is speaking to an individual named Ananias, who is a Jewish man. He says, go there and you'll find Saul and lay hands on him. And he's like, whoa, the same Saul that's murdering all my friends, that guy, the one that's throwing everybody in prison. Are you insane? I'm not going there. Paraphrasing, of course. I would be the same way. I'd be like, can I just pray for him from afar? Can I send him like a, one of those fruit baskets? Can we, can we, is there anything that I can do from remote? I don't really want to be in the same room as this guy. What if he just you know, go shishai shishai on me with a sword and then I'm dead. I don't want to be in that room. And yet he still is obedient. He goes there. He lays hands on Saul. I'd be, I'd be like, as far as away as I could, be like, be healed, be healed. And then just be in the running stance. But he lays hands on Saul. Saul regains his vision. In that moment, he gets baptized Ananias affirms or reaffirms rather the calling now that Saul has over his life, which is to meet, minister to many different people, but first to the Gentiles, which is again, all of us who are not Jewish. And so the, the, the gift is from God. The price that was paid was from God, but the message delivered of that gift was brought through Paul. And so he's affirmed. He goes right from there, goes to the synagogue to start proclaiming Jesus. Again, if you're in the middle of a worship service and you turn around and you look and the guy who is killing all of your people is walking through the back, I'm sorry, I probably wouldn't be looking forward anymore. I'd be like, where is the security team at? Why, what is happening? <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. Why did I not go online today? I should have just watched on Facebook, right? And so he goes there and he starts proclaiming Jesus and the rest is history. The rest, he radically changes the world. He brings the gospel, the good news. He brings structure and order. He begins to establish churches. He begins to lay out for all humanity what the church of God is to look like and act like and how it is to maintain righteousness and holiness. What Paul writes in his, in his books is um, lifeblood for every believer and for every church. And so Paul has experienced something miraculous. I have one more portion of scripture to read about Paul, and then I'll, I'll bring this home for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 28. This is now Paul saved, now recounting a different part of his life. Not the old part where he was this murderous individual, but now he's looking back and going, this is who I am as a new believer in Jesus Christ. And, and more importantly, the whole chapter talks about that, but this portion talks about the torture and the things that he went through. He's kind of rereading again his list, but it's for the sake of Christ instead of being against Christ. It says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. He could have just said 39. I'm not sure why he had to write it like that. But 40 lashes minus one. 25, or excuse me, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger 
from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles. Everyone wanted to kill this guy. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from all other things, you know, it's crazy, excuse me, smart from other things. I don't know, one of those other things is when he got shipwrecked, immediately as he's building the fire, he gets bit by a, by a venomous snake, you know, just those little things. Apart from all these other things, there is a daily, daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches, because he led so many different churches as the apostolic leader. We know later on that Paul was um, beheaded as a martyr. Kind of came full circle on him. But um, he, you could say it this way. Even if you don't believe in luck, Paul had bad luck, right? I don't really believe in luck. Paul had bad luck. Like, it would, be, it would be the equivalent of this. Paul just ran into every situation possible. He would be the only person in the history of the world to get COVID five times. <laughs> Less one, so four times, right? Like, that's just Paul. Like, that would literally be added as the list because Paul just, it's just nothing the guy did worked. And yet he advanced the gospel. I mean, at some point, stop going on a ship. Sometime around the second sinking, just stop. And now I know he was a prisoner, but stop bringing him on ships. He's a bad luck, <laughs> all right? You're not going to enjoy your, your travels. So Paul's life has completely changed around. God has radically changed his heart. And now instead of being a spreader of hate and a spreader of division, he is a spreader of God's love and his mercy and God's grace. So phenomenal story. If any of us should take heart, we should take heart in Paul's story because of what he's gone through, what he did, and yet God could still and did use him. So here's where it lands for us. This, this is where it applies to us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. The one big thing that's coming up here. Not that I have already attained this or am already perfect. So he's already acknowledging, like, listen, guys, I don't got this thing figured out. This isn't a Paul story. This isn't a me thing. I have not got this all figured out. But I press on to make it my own, the calling, to make what God has placed before me my own. I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Stopping right there. This is not the message, but this is important. Paul lived his life out of identity, not out of his past, and not out of who he was, good or bad. He says, I haven't attained it. I haven't figured this thing out. I'm thankful that he admitted that because that's how I'm sure almost all of us feel. I'm not there, man. I don't got, I, I, sometimes I can't even figure it today out, let alone the you know, next few steps. Paul's saying, I don't got to figure it out. But the reason why I keep moving forward is because Christ made me his own. When you live out of an identity, a biblical identity of who you are in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, you're qualified. See, if it always comes back to you, the reason why you can't fully follow Jesus, the reason why you can't serve him, or the reason why you're not um, with boldness proclaiming the truth of Jesus, whatever calling, whatever circumstance you find yourself in where you have an opportunity to live holy and to bring the goodness of God, whatever excuse you have, if it ends up being about you, or about the enemy, or about people around you, you have the wrong source, and you're plugged into the wrong source. Paul said, listen, it's not that I don't know any of this stuff. I know all the things that I did, but the reason why I keep moving forward is because Christ made me his own. I am, a, in this case, a son of the Lord Most High, creator of heavens and earth. And so when you live not out of me, Jerry Tyson, I made all these mistakes and I have a few successes and a few things going for me. If I live out of that source, very quickly, I will find my limitations and I will live within those limitations. There will be an invisible lid and it's called me or the enemy or other people. But when my source and my identity is Jesus Christ, I will live out of something more. This is the driving factor for Paul. In fact, identity always trumps our past, our current, and our future. 
No matter what's out in front of us, no matter what we're dealing with right now or what's behind us, identity in God trumps it. It's more important if we allow that truth to be the focus of our hearts. It's not that God's going to make it more truth in our lives. It's we have to believe it. We have to fight for it. We have to accept the identity as not just sons and daughters, but those that have been forgiven. We have to accept it. And so what, what Paul's saying here is, I'm able to move forward because there's grace. I'm able to move forward because God has mercy, because I've been forgiven, because he loves me. I have been made his own. That's the reason why I'm able to move forward. Now let's continue on in verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So he's not claiming credit for this. But one thing I do, stop right there. The writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, the one that radically changes everything for the entire history of mankind, when he says, of all the things that I've written down, there's one thing that I do, I want to listen to that. All the other things are great. They're all wonderful lessons. But when he says, there's one thing, I must be honest, we listen to a lot of preachers, not me, but a lot of preachers that never get to the point. I'm joking. <laughs> like, just give me the point, man. Say it in the first five minutes, and then I can leave, right? Some of you are like, amen to that. Jeez. Um, but Paul says, there's one thing I do. Okay, okay, let's listen to that. The one thing, the, what is the driving force? The one thing, we know whatever that one thing is, you're able to do that because of grace and mercy, because of your identity. We know, we know why you're able to do it, but what's the one thing that Paul does, and therefore that we can apply to our lives? The one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's hard. See, because as human beings, Paul included, we have memories. We've been blessed with them. We can remember things right? If you're married here, regarding your spouse, they remember things, right? <laughs> Am I the only one? Okay. We remember things. We remember the good things, and we remember those that have wronged us. We remember those that have said those things, those that posted that thing about us. We have memories. But Paul says, I forget what lies behind. Is he saying he legitimately can't remember? No, God blessed us with memory. It's he chooses not to elevate those things in his life. See, God is the only one that is able to actually forget. It's not that he's forgetful, it's that he chooses to forget. Roman, or Psalms 103 verse 10 through 12 says, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. I'm thankful for that. For as, a, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who hear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And there's other scriptures that talk about God forgetting and casting those things into a sea and not remembering them and not bringing them up. The reality is this. Although we are unable to do this, God chooses to forget our sins. So here's how this works. When you sin, you humble your heart and you come back to God and say, God, I am sorry for doing, you fill in the blank. And the word tells us that if we will humble ourselves, ask for forgiveness, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we have a promise from God based on his character, not ours, Based on who he is, not what we deserve, we have a promise from God that if we ask for forgiveness, that not only are we forgiven, but our sins, have, we have been cleansed from all unrighteousness. And so I wonder how many times we actually remind God of things that he chose to forget about us. So another, I'll give you an example. Let's say, because um, none of us ever do this, Let, let's say we're driving and someone cuts us off and we say some choice words to them, right? Maybe show them a finger or two. I don't know, like, do some things that are definitely not Christian-based, right? That's not how godly people act. In the moment, humble yourself and ask for forgiveness and mean it. From that point forward, accept forgiveness. I wonder how many wasted, not wasted prayers, it's probably not the right word, but time spent asking for secondary, third 
fourth, fifth layers of forgiveness do we spend? I know I do that. In that example, I'll say something. God, will you please forgive me? I should not have said that. Bam, in that moment, forgiven, cleansed from unrighteousness. And like 10 minutes later, Lord, I, I, I really am sorry. That, oh God, that really was not good. I wonder in that moment, of course, I'm not God, I don't know, but I wonder, he's got to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not good, not because he's forgetful, but because according to his character, he chooses to forget. He chooses to not hold that against us anymore. He chooses to not hold that over us as a banner of failure. How many times do you spend a day, a week, month, whatever, reminding God of what he chose to forget about you? It does you no good. It does the people around you no good. It does your relationship with God no good. You somehow punishing yourself for whatever reason does not get you closer to the things of God. I don't know all the reasons why someone would not fully receive the forgiveness. I know for me at times, it's because I honestly wanted, I, I, I felt like I needed to punish myself more. I felt like I knew that God's grace was enough, but I, you know, I had to learn my lesson. I had to really feel the sting of this thing. I had to, you know, I don't want to be one of those Christians that just flippantly says, forgive me, and that's it. I, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm a Christian, and I, and I want to, you know, put me in the game, coach, kind of thing. But that's not the way you do it. Learn from your past. Grow from your past. Take note of it. If there's people that you've wronged, to ask for forgiveness from them. If there's things that you've done that you've not repented of, ask God for forgiveness. But from that point forward, reference your past as a place of learning, but not as a place of residing. From that point forward, you're forgiven. For whatever reason, you would keep bringing that up. If I got to punish myself or if, 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 if I ask for forgiveness and actually act like I've been forgiven, they might not think I'm serious. Again, there's probably 25, 30 different reasons why you would not fully receive the grace gift of forgiveness. But it's not biblical, and it's definitely not the heart of God. Paul says, the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and pressing on toward what lies ahead, straining forward. Wow. For him to say that, again, and, and, and comparison is dangerous, but we've all done some bad things. But chances are we've not kicked doors down and dragged men and women to their death and slaughtered them and all that kind of stuff. Comparison's dangerous, but for the sake of just hearing the heartbeat of God, if God can forgive and redeem and then give brand new purpose and hope to Paul and then use him to bring thousands and thousands of untold people into the kingdom of heaven. Is it possible that whatever you've done, if you have laid it down at the feet of Christ, that he too can forgive and heal and set free and repurpose you? Again, not out of comparison, because you know what the thing about the past does? It does one of two things. The past, if we had this last place, this sin, this messed up, I, I really did it again. It can bring shame into our lives. But you know what the past can also do? It can bring us pride. Look what I've done. God, I'm not like Paul or all these other Christians. They're definitely not the person next to me. I go to church. I read my Bible. I do this pride, 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 pride. The pride of our past, the shame of our past does the same thing. It holds us back. It holds us down. It's a burden that Christ never designed you or I to carry. And yet so often we have our future out ahead of us. We have our right now with God. And yet we can't go anywhere because tied to us is bricks and, and, and different cement and metal and all of this weight that's holding us back because we have the different banners, the different ribbons, the different memories, those things in our lives that are so real and vivid to us and that we feel that we have to hold on to them. Maybe it's our identity that gives us identity. Maybe like those weighted blankets, it just brings us comfort. Even though we did some bad things, at least we know who we are. It gives us comfort. Whatever it is, we hold on to the good, the bad, everything in between. We hold on to that. And Christ is like, I need you as set free, born again individuals. I need you to lay aside those things that so easily ensnare you. And that's not always only sin. It's also your past. 
Learn and grow from your past, but don't allow it to dictate and grow you in the wrong direction. Don't allow it to stunt you, to be that invisible lid in your life. I love the next verse of Paul. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is a prize. There is a goal, and it's in Christ Jesus. It's not in you. It's not for you. It's not through you. It's not by you. You are not the source nor the destination. Jesus Christ is the source and the destination. You choose. Are you going to receive from that well and go in that direction, or are you going to choose to stay in your well and stay in your direction? The battlefield that we have, just like Paul said, is the pressing and the straining, the pressing, the straining, because you know what? The enemy is going to come back at you and go, yeah, but you haven't learned your lesson. Yeah, but you're not strong enough. Yeah, but you remember when you did this. Yeah, but you remember how awesome you are. The pressing, the straining, the battlefield that you and I have is to recognize that our past is our past, but our future and our right now is with Christ. And we have to remind ourselves, and just like Paul, we have to strain and we have to press because it does not come natural. It's not going to come without a fight. It's going to come with every ounce that you have trusting in Jesus Christ. Christ, not remind him of how messed you up you are or how amazing you are, but just being and residing with him every step along the way. It requires trust. It requires, it requires transparency. It requires faith in Jesus Christ. It's the pressing and the straining that Paul speaks about. Here's a simple way to know where you're, where you're at. Does what you're talking about, does it point people to you? or other things, or does it point people to Jesus? Because you can tell a story, share, share your testimony, share your past. But is it ultimately to show how good you are or to show how rotten you are? Or is it to show how redeeming Jesus is? When you share your history, does it point towards, towards Jesus, towards others? As you stand up, let me read this. Last two verses from Paul here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15 through 16. Let those of us who are mature think this way. In other words, maturing, growing up Christians need to condition their thoughts. They need to think this way, press and strain. If any of you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Basically what he's saying is this, like mature people, we understand this. Those of you who haven't gotten it yet, it's okay. One day you'll get there. So maybe a little bit of sarcasm in there. But those of you that think otherwise, God revealed it to you also. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have obtained. You know what I love about that? Is although the vast majority of what's done in our lives is done through God, there's still a partnership. And while all the glory belongs to God, Paul says here, let us hold fast to what we have obtained. I lo- what I love about God is even though the victory is his, the work is his, all of that, God still invites us to be a part of the story, to be a part of the victory, to be part of the party and the celebration. Let us hold fast to what we have obtained. All these ribbons up here. Some of you, as the Holy Spirit is revealing to you what you have, maybe it's pride, maybe it's shame, maybe it's any other layer or any other level that you have. I believe even in this message that God is revealing to you the areas that have held you back. These ribbons, when I was a kid, made all the difference in the world. These are the greatest thing to me. Now, they sit in a chest that my dad made for me and gave me when I was in my mid-20s. I'd held all my kids' stuff in it. Every once in a while, I'll go back through and I'll, oh, that's right, I do have a, I do have a ribbon that says first place. I do have that. Oh, that's, I remember that was a good memory. I'm like, ooh, that was a bad memory. But I don't live by it. It's not, it's not on me as a name badge. It's not, it's not the first thing that I have or the last thing that I have. These ribbons are good reminders, good marker points, good things to remember every once in a while. But they don't drive my life anymore. Let's not let our past, your past, drive yours. When the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you have to, in obedience, you should, in obedience, release that to Him. Father, I ask right now, as you have been ministering, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to do so, even beyond this service in the, in the days and weeks to come, Lord, that you would reveal to people by your grace, Lord, the areas in their lives that, that, that have been holding them back, the, the areas in their lives that, uh, whether it be pride or shame, that has been weighing them down. 
that they would be like Paul that would say, you know what, honestly, it doesn't really matter the past because you've forgiven me. What matters, Christ, is my obedience to you today. And will I be obedient to you tomorrow? And in those times and seasons where I mess up intentionally or unintentionally, when I ask for forgiveness, that I can right away be restored and back into a level of obedience with you again. And so, Lord, I just ask that as you reveal that, Lord, that prideful hearts would not resist, but they would receive that. They would ask for forgiveness if that's what's needed. And, Lord, that they would walk away, that they would put the ribbons and the awards and the placards and the marks, that they would put that in their past. Let it be back there as they move forward with you. God, we love you. We thank you for doing for us and for Paul what no one else could do, saving us and setting us free. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.